welcome. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a project I was working on uh, last year called uh, the Birmingham Civic Dashboard. Um, I just want to say, um, I'm primarily a web developer. Uh, I've been working with uh, Ruby and various technologies for uh, quite a long time. And um, I was contacted by um, Mudlark, a, uh, I think some of my slides have been cut off, hasn't it? Um, I, by, a, by a digital design agency in the UK, uh, which is where I lived until last year, um, called Mudlark, uh, who were working with the digital wing of the city council. Um, to do this project where they were getting a, going to be given a dumps of data from the council's call centres um, and they wanted to, to know what could, what could they do. They wanted to try and, and find out um, what they could do. So uh, this is where it gets... I should probably show you the site. Now, who's, has anyone here actually seen it? Uh, if we get this to go full screen again. Has anyone, any, hands up, anyone who's seen the, okay, we've got one, so I'll, I will go through it in, in some depth. Um, so this is, this is the site. Uh, oh, Chrome's being mis badly behaved. Hang on. So um, what it essentially is, is the call centre that Birmingham City Council has, uh, they record every contact they have, so telephone calls, emails, um, people using, I think, you kind of, web contact forms, anything like that gets categorized and put into a database and then we get a dump of some of that data, uh, almost all of that data, not quite everything. Um, and they wanted to, to put it on a website so that the public could actually see uh, what was going on. So what we've got here, basically these are um, locations where uh, something was happening and the colors represent the part of the council that was dealing with that um, dealing with that query and we have data down to the level of we know what hour the phone call or the email was received we don't know what minute but we know what hour so we can do some things like this so show you uh, over the course of the day what the you know what the kind of peaks and activity were and as you as you would expect they pretty much follow uh, the usual pattern of it's busy at lunchtime and it's less busy at midnight. And there are some other little visualizations that we, which I'll, I'll touch on very briefly, but really this, isn't, this talk is more about the, the back end. Um, right. Oh, don't you start now. Um, so what do we get? We're getting, basically the system looks a bit like this. Uh, we get a dump of data from the council's SAP system, uh, which gets imported. And uh, first off, it gets imported pretty naively into a SQL database. And then that stuff gets aggregated and transformed and put into a, into a Mongo document, um, one per day, and then uh, some more stuff happens with that, which I'll come on to later. And then uh, the front-end application is a Rails app, uh, so talking uh, to Mongo and to, to Postgres and producing HTML and uh, actually more CSV. One of the interesting things about this is it, it's, it's kind of notionally highly structured data. Um, so I'll, I'll show you what that means because when you or I think about highly structured, we may, may think um, that means highly semantic. Um, but actually, uh, really, this is, this is what's meant by um, highly structured. Uh, this is actually the document that the council uses to uh, define its data structure. And uh, it's really genuinely the document they use, um, which is kind of... It's a, it's a six-level hierarchy. We've only got four levels here because we were only using four levels and this isn't in quite everything. Um, so they have, a, they have a very interesting way of, of viewing that stuff, which isn't really anything to do with the kind of data modeling that you or I might be familiar with. Um, 
it's, it's a very kind of process driven where people are used to dealing with Excel and nothing else. Um, but that's where we started from. So basically, that, that list drives the interaction of call center staff with the public. Um, they, when a call comes in or when an email is received, they pick from that list, um, which goes six levels deep. And I mean, just at the fourth level, there's about 700 different choices you could make. And you kind of narrow it down through hierarchies, and it goes... Actually, we, we show this on the site, so you can see there's about 10 top-level directorates, and each of those have a few inside them, and then they have some more inside them. And then you arrive at something that's a bit more um, finely done. Uh, and, I, and then we get the kind of the uh, we get the output from that system once a day as a, as a dump that looks a bit like this. Uh, it's a CSV uh, dumped out by SAP. Um, I've removed all the postcodes from this because I don't want to keep any personally identifying information in. Um, and there's, we get about 10,000 lines a day. On a busy day, you get about 10,000 interactions, get recorded. Um, so we have about 10,000 lines of this kind of thing a day to deal with. And, and I, don't I think we still don't understand what a lot of it does because it's, it's really it's data that's used primarily to deliver services. It's not data that was designed uh, with explicability in mind. It wasn't data that was designed in order to allow you to see what was going on as an outsider. It was data that was designed to kind of keep things moving as, as an insider. Um, let's go. So the schema wasn't really a schema. It was more of an ontology. But the ontology wasn't really an ontology. It was a spreadsheet. Um, and the structure wasn't really a structure in as much as it was a reflection of the organization and how the organization wanted to think of itself and how the organization uh, structured itself in terms of service delivery and um, politicking. Very, very tightly coupled to the org chart, which caused some interesting problems, which I'll come to in a bit. Um, the other issues we had with this were... Um, SAPs, uh, we were using a thing called OpenHub. I think I'm probably jumping ahead of myself slightly. Um, OpenHub, which is a, an SAP, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it does, but it basically enables you to get data out and into other things. But its conception of a CSV wasn't a CSV. It was a fixed width, um, basically fixed, fixed width field. And there was a comma delimiter, delimiter, but the comma delimiter was essentially superfluous. Um, there was no quoting of fields, and everything was truncated at a, a fairly arbitrary character limit, um, which made, made life very difficult. And we had to go backwards and forwards, and um, I think it was genuinely quite difficult for them to actually get something more useful out of the system, because the system really wasn't set up to deal with that. <laughs> um, the other thing was that the schema, in as much as it because it was so tightly tied to the organization chart. Um, as, as the council got on with its business, it kept deciding it didn't like the shape of the organization. And so it kept making quite radical changes to the structure of itself and the structure of this data. And, and oftentimes, um, the actual impact on the day-to-day -day running of the council was, was minimal. But basically what it meant, there's a lot of name changes and a lot of things that were slightly further down the tree being moved into the auspices of a new chunk or uh, a top-level entity that wasn't really one entity anymore, getting split up into two or maybe more entities. Um, so we actually had to graft in a way of uh, editorializing some of those changes late into the day. Uh, and the other big problem we have with this kind of data is the personal data problem. And the personal data problem essentially is that um, because this is data aimed at service delivery, everything's in there. So we have people's addresses. Uh, well, we have people's postcodes. Now, the thing with the UK postcode system is that um, UK postcodes are accurate down to below street level. Um, they're 
accurate to the level, of, basically I think it's what's, what's called a postman's walk. So the, the amount um, of houses a postman can do with a single bag of mail. So it's, depending on the density of the area, it's something like 15 houses. So it's, it's incredibly identifying. And um, coupled with uh, things like um, scarcity of information, so if not many calls are recorded from a particular area, any postcode you have, you know, because you know what the call was about, or the contact was about, it actually becomes very easy to, to identify people that way. And we've seen how easy it was with the uh, notionally fully anonymized data from, you know, remember the, the AOL dump. Um, this is just really, really, really easy, so we have to be very careful with that. Um, so the other things were almost everything in the... Um, Almost everything in the, in the data was stuff that looked like text but was actually enumerated values. And I think if anyone ever works with SAP type stuff, I think you'll probably find this a lot, that lots of things that look like free text fields are in fact enumerated values. Um, and it's hard to tell which ones they are, and it's, it's basically impossible to get a complete and exhaustive list of all the possible values there might be. And we had this problem going for several months afterwards where rare cases would crop up and we would suddenly get a, a row of data that couldn't be imported because we didn't know about some of the components. Um, and as I said, the strangest things will be genuinely hard for the provider of data. Uh, so wrangling CSVs, because uh, we didn't have much money. We didn't have much money to give to the, um, the part of the council that actually deals with IT. Uh, so they couldn't do a huge amount of custom development just to give us data. So they were kind of left wrangling the tools they had. And the tools they had didn't necessarily want to um, provide you with... The, the, the tools that were supposed to provide CSVs didn't provide uh, genuinely compliant CSVs. Um, and uh, actually getting the data from them to us proved to be very hard. We had to wind up setting up a, uh, uh, a, a custom server that just there to receive SFTP pushes uh, of large dumps of data. Um, this is the SQL, roughly the SQL scheme. You can see at the top here is uh, the contact, which is the I've called the council, I've emailed the council. And all these other fields essentially hang off it. And they're all, as I said, they're all basically enumerations. They're all normalized values of some kind. Um, and we needed to figure out what can you do with this data, because no one really knew. Because, and when you see data in spreadsheet land, you just see lots and lots and lots and lots of rows, and it's quite hard to figure out what you did. So the first thing you need to do is you need to do some data exploration. You figure out what you can do, um, how you slice the data. And what you want to do with that is you want to, to find out, basically, what does it boil down to? Uh, you apply something like a, like a kind of third normalization form kind of approach, where you're trying to find out, oh, where, where does this thing actually occur? You know, we had a list of a contact with had. You know, 20 or 30 possible values. But actually, um, there was a hierarchy disguised in there. You know, it, was, it was part of an activity that was part of a, a service, which was part of a di uh, division, which is part of a directorate. And those things aren't apparent at first, first view, and you need to tease those things out. Um, and that's what we did with Mongo. So we had the, 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 dumb, the dumb, naive dump of the data in, in a SQL database, and then we went to Mongo. And, and you start to think about it, and this is kind of what you end up with. You end up with this thing at the top where uh, everything, everywhere, and then you start to cut down by the, the structure and also by the location. And you can refine that a bit because actually, really, um, stuff always happens. If it's located, it happens in a, in a particular place. Um, and actually, everything else is essentially aggregations of that one thing. Uh, but when you come down to it, when you actually want to process it, you really want to be working with something like this because you're asking questions of particular places rather than asking those aggregated questions. Uh, so you end up with quite deeply nested data structures. Um, find my notes. So um, <laughs> there are a bunch of... Uh, object data mappers and object relational mappers uh, available for Mongo on Ruby and also in other languages. And they're very seductive. Um, 
But the place they fell down, I mean, I, I think this may have changed a little bit now, but the place they, they fell down uh, was dealing with arbitrarily nested kind of things that are roughly equivalent in the, in the, in the kind of architectural model of the, of the code to, to self-joins. But you've got the same model object that's nested inside itself several times, and they really couldn't deal with that at all. Um, The thing to remember when you're dealing with deeply nested uh, structures in Mongo is it's a big hash. It's just a big hash. It's, it's hashes of arrays, arrays of hashes, arrays of arrays. Um, and your language has pretty good first-class tools for dealing with those things, usually. Um, but what you will need to do is you'll need to have a fairly rich uh, data model um, domain logic on top of that. Because if you don't, uh, you'll, you won't know how to, to re-stitch those things together. And, and that's actually what we spent most of our time on the project doing, was developing this thing that allowed us to see the data, to actually play with it and ask those questions of that, of that large aggregated data structure. Um, so we could get rid of, you know, we didn't have to store a lot of stuff. And every time there was a zero value, we didn't have to store that. And actually, it turns out that when you've got um, like 30,000 different ways of cutting the data, but you only have six to 10,000 contacts a day, a lot of stuff, most stuff, won't have anything in it. Um, and also, uh, when you're dealing with a relation database, you need to beware of data duplication and make sure that you're properly normalized. Um, when you're dealing with a situation like this, where essentially what you're doing is uh, aggregating a bunch of data into a fairly static read-only view in Mongo. Uh, what you want to do, really, is make your life as easy as possible. And a lot of times, that's going to mean uh, duplicating values here and there, essentially denormalizing. Um, because you're dealing with something that is read-only, generated once, that's often going to be much easier. Um, sometimes it isn't easier. And sometimes it can really hurt you. If you're dealing with things where it's not essentially static data, then you, you, know, you need to apply the same kind of wariness as you would in SQL land. But um, a lot of the time, it's easier. Uh, the big problem we had with, with that view was that data was enormous. So, I mean, the JSON representation on disk of a full day's data was about two megabytes. Um, which you can't really pull in in a web request cycle. You can't, you know, even if everything's super quick, that's just a lot of data. Um, so what we ended up doing was uh, snapshotting. Because if you, look, if you look hard, what you're actually only ever displaying is, is, a, is, a, is a, a piece of that structure in a particular place. And uh, what we do now is we basically just take that little bit that you're interested in showing on a particular web page and store that. And suddenly you have something that takes up two or three K on disk. Um, it's very easy to get from Mongo. It means your response times come right down. So that's kind of, um, that was the key really with, with getting some kind of reasonable performance out of this, out of this site. Um, so I imagine I've got about five minutes. Um, when I showed you the, the, uh, the, the schema before, which had all those, those columns and identifiers in, um, other things that turn out is that that is also a, uh, a, that schema has fixed width columns. And you have to s display this, this kind of stuff. And if you're ever dealing with these things, you'll have the same problems. Which are, there's, a, there's an editorial disconnect between uh, what you want to show people and the data you have. And we had to develop a system to allow um, editorial people to come in and actually expand these very truncated descriptions of uh, service and activity levels. Um, because otherwise, you ended up with uh, things that were camel cased and run together. And you can't really show that on a website. Um, and the other the thing that, really, that, that came up uh, and was quite interesting was that we didn't really know what order things should be in. 
Um, and we didn't think about it for a long time. We just kind of threw stuff in, in in something that approached alphabetical order. And then people started to worry about whether the alphabetical order implied a kind of importance ordering that we hadn't intended to give it. Um, and you'll need to be wary of things like that, where stuff that is, seems very value neutral to you is actually quite highly charged, particularly if you're working with um, uh, large organizations, uh, various bits of those organizations, you know, there will be stuff that is important to them, and uh, you may not realize that it's important to them, and you may not be able to, to deal with it. And then, um, in terms of In terms of the performance stuff, essentially we had very little time and very little money and we shipped initially our exploration prototype. And that really hurt once we started to get a sensible amount of data into the system because the performance really wasn't up to it. And actually what we should have done, what I would urge you to do is if you do a project like this where you have to wrangle a, a bunch of data just to find out what the data is and how, how you can work with it, is you want to throw away whatever you used um, to do that exploration when it comes to actually presenting it in a service. Because as, I, as we went through there, you know, we kind of went through uh, from just dumps of data in a SQL database to a, quite a complex uh, nested Mongo document to a much simpler snapshot. And that was what we needed in order to display things to the public. Um, but we didn't know we needed that until we'd gone through all these other steps. And actually what we should have done is taken a step back at that point and go, well, this is what we need to get to, and this is where we start, and there may well have been a much better way to get from there to there that didn't involve this kind of multi-stage transformation going through. And, th and that's, that's one of my biggest regrets, really, is that we didn't have the time or money to go back and revisit, revisit that properly. Um, we ship CSV out from the system as well. So if you want to download a record of all the contacts, you can do that. Um, we ship out a CSV, and it's, uh, it's got a slightly reduced set. We don't give you all the stuff that the council give us because of their various privacy and other concerns. Um, and we give you something that has, uh, it has some postcode data in, but it's truncated postcode data. So instead of referring to 15 houses in the street, it refers to an area of a kind of half a mile radius. So, uh, so you know, a couple of kilometers. So much harder to identify people from that. But uh, it's useful enough to make statements about trends and about things that are happening in, in areas. But it takes a long time to generate that. Um, if you've got to generate 10,000 lines of CSV out of a database, you know, it's not super complicated. There's just quite a lot of bytes you have to move along a string. Move, move along the wire uh, in order to get that to the user. And uh, we deploy on Heroku, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Um, they have a hard 30 second limit on response. If you don't start providing bytes from your application to the user within 30 seconds, they kill the process. And on busy days, the, so where we had somewhere, something like something more than 7,000 or so rows, and that the, the most complete CSV wouldn't generate because it took more than 30 seconds to start uh, sending bytes. And we had to switch from uh, Heroku's Bamboo to Cedar stacks and start using um, chunked responses and streaming in order to get ourselves back into that. But that was actually an enormous architectural change that could have been disastrous. We had to do after we'd shipped into production because until we'd gone into live, we didn't know that we were going to hit that 30 second limit. Other things we saw towards the end, when we actually had enough of a product to show to people, was that there were things that we hadn't thought of as necessarily being problematic or personally identifying that were immediately flagged by people at the council as being potentially, potentially personally identifying information. And we had to make a bunch of changes and do some redactions in order to not do that. And if you work with this kind of data as well, there will be stuff that you will not see until right at the last minute, and you'll need to be prepared to deal with that, and you want to get something that's as close to a, a full prototype up as soon as possible so that the people who will notice those things can notice them as soon as possible. Um, the dots on those maps are provided by uh, Google's KML layers. Um, 
they, KML layers have a hard limit of 10,000 roughly points on a layer that they will display. But they start to get funky at about uh, a lot less than that. Um, and you will see things like, if you want to rely on this, and so you'll see things like response times from KML that are long enough that you will time out on dragging the KML. And so sometimes you'll get a map, and sometimes you won't. So you'll get a map with dots. Sometimes you won't get the dots um, on, on busy things. And then they will appear immediately the next time because they have been generated and cached by Google. Also, when you're developing that stuff, you have to be able to provide a public URL to Google for them to consume to turn into the KML tiles. And uh, that was something that took us a bit, of a, a bit of time to get our head around, and we had to make some changes and, and make sure that we weren't then shipping dangerous public stuff out to Google in order that we could test to see that we were generating the KMLs correctly. Um, so <laughs> we're deploying this on Heroku, uh, which is a platform as a service provider. I'm sure any people not familiar with Heroku? Not? So everyone's familiar with Heroku, yeah? Oh, we've got a couple of people. So Heroku is, is basically, it's like, um, in as much as EC2 is infrastructure on demand, uh, Heroku is platform on demand. So they give you the entire stack, and all you have to do is inject your application into it. And they have a very, very slick deployment process, which makes that incredibly easy. Um, all our Mongo stuff, there are cloud-hosted Mongo providers. Um, we use Mongo HQ because uh, Mongo HQ have an, an add-on for Heroku, which makes it almost uh, trivial to provision a Mongo service for your Heroku application. Um, so Heroku is great because initial deployment setup time is almost zero. There's a fabulously wide range of add-ons that are really easy to integrate. Horizontal scale-out is very, very easy. But it gets expensive very quickly. Uh, it's like five cents an hour, I think. So it's much more expensive than base EC2. Um, and if you have to scale workers or scale web instances, um, you can suddenly go from something that costs you 15 or $30 a month to run to something that costs you six or $700 a month to run and not really notice. Um, there's no vertical scale for your app server instances. While a lot of the add-on services, so um, the database services, things like MongoHQ, they have vertical scale options. The core app server instances do not. You, are, you get what you get, and there's no getting away from that. And actually, a lot of our problems would have been made easier by having things like um, uh, on disk uh, storage on the instance and a bit more memory and that would have made that stuff a lot easier but you can't get that with Heroku and you may find that's a deal breaker in certain kinds of applications that is 90% of the time you won't notice um, and that 30 second request limit is a hard limit and that really hurts sometimes um, there are a bunch of assumptions you shouldn't make that we made um, don't assume that just because it's a, an automated system that's providing your data, it's going to provide you your data automatically. Um, don't make assumptions about the availability, reliability, and frequency of data provision. It turns out that even though it's a giant SAP system, people have to put the data in. And some days, if they have problems, they can't put the data in. So they write it all down on bits of paper, and it gets put in like in a mammoth shift at a weekend. So you may not get data for a couple of days because they had a system problem. And then you'll get three days of data at once. Or it'll just be a bit delayed because they had to run a whole bunch of stuff at year end and your job just got pushed beyond its normal run and didn't get run that day. There's a whole bunch of things that can happen there um, that meant that you can't assume, you know, you cannot assume you will reliably get data every day at the time you think you will. Um, and uh, Updates to the schema will appear. Uh, it's a thing that we initially thought wouldn't happen very much because, you know, who, how often do a large, you know, I mean, Birmingham is the largest municipal authority in Europe. It's huge. How often does an organization like that change its, its org structure significantly? Every three months, it turns out. Um, so, yeah, don't be that guy. Um, there was a lot of panic when suddenly we realized we just got this working with this particular representation and, and it was all changing. And problems you have there are things like if you're tracking trend data. So we just look at the previous day's data to do a bit of 
very simple trend calculations that we can say, it's not even trend really, it's, we can say it's more than yesterday or less than yesterday. And if stuff suddenly jumps from one category to another category, unless you know that yesterday it was in this category and today it's in this category, you can't track those changes. Um, ooh, that's cut off. Um, I think that's really all I need to say. Um, I just want to thank uh, Digital Birmingham and Mudlark, who worked with uh, Ben Viner, who worked with me on the data exploration site and actually designed the typeface I'm using. Um, Nesta funded the project, and Birmingham City Council actually were the first people to really take that step and say, let's open this data up. And that was, uh, that was actually very brave of them. Um, I think I've got time for questions. Okay, we've uh, got 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so first question is, how many people were there on your team when you started working on this? Uh, there, were, uh, there was me, um, um, Ben, who worked with me on the kind of uh, data exploration side, and there was a designer at Mudlock. And um, what took us. longer? Hmm? Exploring, the, exploring the data or then actually coming up with the visualization of, of the whole project? Um, so the data exploration uh, hmm. drove the choices that were made about visualization, and that was the thing that took the longest. I mean, it was a project that took about a month, um, start Last to finish, one? and uh, the data exploration took most of that. Hmm. And what was the reception? Did, did people use it? Was it widely used? Um, so uh, it's, it's had a very, very good reception um, from, uh, from the council and from other political bits of the UK. So it's been very well received and lauded by the cabinet office um, and, and other organizations like that. So that's gone really well. Um, it's not being used a whole lot. Um, but I think it's one of those things where We're really, what we were trying to do wasn't, wasn't to, to provide a kind of singing, dancing service to end all services. We were trying to figure out if you could do anything at all. Um, and we did it on very little money and very little time. And so I think you know, people still do use it. And I think people come in and the people who use it use it a lot. Uh, but it's not, I mean, it's not something that thousands of people go to every day. More questions? Did you end up doing much in the way of geographical querying, or was it mostly just ward-based? It's, it's, uh, there's no geographical querying. All the geo stuff essentially um, is, is just because we had, we had those organization, that, that ward and constituency organization level, so we could just group stuff through that. Um, and all the postcode related stuff is done as a, what we did was we, we had postcode data for everything, and then we, we truncated postcodes and we recalculated the center of the geoids for all of those now wider sector postcode type areas. Um, I, anyone who knows much about postcodes, so we took the, the outward um, thing, which is the first three or four characters of a UK postcode and the first letter of the, the inward sorting one. So we got the, the district and then a, a, a chunk of the sector inside that. Um, so no one can do searching on that stuff but we use that to do uh, grouping queries to generate um, the KML layer. But really, it's all, I mean, a lot of this is, of necessity, slightly smoke and mirrorish. Um, because it's, you know, we get a dump of data once a day. So it's just kind of turning that into something that you can, you can at least get a sense of the things that are going on. And it was very interesting. Um, and we got some test data through before Christmas, and you can see the kind of, the way that, um, you know, people calling in and, and, and contacting about certain kinds of services, that just plummets around Christmas, then you're just left with a whole bunch of things that are the kind of core, uh, core functions that the council provides, like, I mean, housing related stuff, they must have had, you know, like, there's a whole load of stuff about housing repairs in that kind of cold weather snap. There was a cold weather snap around then, so there's a whole lot of things that say, oh, actually, you know, this stuff gets really busy at these times of year, this stuff eases off. You can see when there are holidays and weekends, and you can also see where something really big has happened. 
So, I mean, for giving you an overview, it actually works really quite well. Okay, okay more questions? If not, then thank you very much for this interesting talk.